Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have another special guest, Denise Stoner. Uh, she is uh, a proud to be a part of MUFON, the uh, part of the Experience and Research Team, uh, Resource Team. I'm sorry, they changed the name. Experience her resource team. Uh, she's an assistant to uh, George Met Dr. George Medich, the director. Um, she is holds the following positions as Florida MUFON field investigator, star team member, SSD, and is also state director of Florida MUFON. She is co-author and published her first book, Ali The Alien Abduction Files released in May of 2013 with Kathleen Martin. Uh, she holds educational forums with both public and private gatherings for abduction experiencers. Her involvement in the UFO field spans more than 40 years. Um, I won't, she's a, uh, a regression hypnotist and has a background in business and psychology. And she began her hypnosis under Dr. Rob Bob Romack in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I'll just leave her the rest of her intro to her. Uh, welcome to that show, Denise. Thank you for being on my show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. So before we get into your research, way before we get into your research, uh, you are an experiencer yourself, yes? Yes, I am. Yes. OK. Uh, so. Before we get into your experience, your contact experiences, um, what I'd like to know is, is there anything odd that happened to you before you had made contact? Anything odd in your life, like paranormal or anything like, uh, like for instance, what was, what is the very first odd or unusual or strange thing that happened to you in your life ever? The very first thing ever is um, nothing really huge, but my mom went to the hospital to give birth to my sister, my only sibling, and she was a mom that did not leave you. Um, we had my grandparents living with us. They were there if she needed them, but she still would not leave me alone. So I was alone for the first time. I was a little bit nervous about it, but um, my grandfather was taking good care of me. And while he was doing dinner dishes, I looked out the window and I saw a, I was two and a half years old. That's my, the birth of my sister is what triggered the memory for me. I looked out a window, had climbed up on a sofa in a little room we had, and there was an enormous egg that I thought was Humpty Dumpty. A little kid and you look, oh, Humpty Dumpty's come to see me. Um, I kept looking at it. It was right above the telephone lines. This was in Hartford, Connecticut. And my grandfather came through and I showed it to him and I said, where's Humpty's mouth and nose? And of course that didn't exist. It was some kind of craft. So he said, we're gonna go to bed. I'll read you your story. Let's go upstairs, he took me upstairs. And my, my wallpaper was covered with nursery rhyme characters. So I was looking for Humpty Dumpty, didn't see him. We read the story, my grandfather went back downstairs. He was the only one in the house with me. And all of a sudden, a little character stepped out of the wallpaper and he didn't match any of those, the other characters that were in there. He was a little, looked like a monk with a hood he had bell-shaped sleeves, and he was carrying a little very skinny um, instrument of some kind with a tiny light on the end. So he came up to my bed and said, would I like to play? Would I like to have some fun? I said, yeah, I would. I was kind of lonely. So he took my hand, and we went in through the hallway up to the wallpaper there. He touched it with that instrument. And the next thing we knew, we had gone through the wallpaper and we were in a place I didn't recognize. Uh, don't stop. <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. <laughs> okay. 
Um, well, I was looking around and I was in a room that I could say maybe was a kind of a brushed metallic, wasn't shiny. There was a bench that went all the way around the wall, the outside wall. There were no nuts and bolts or seams. It was all one piece. And I looked all the way down to the end and I saw several kids sitting on benches in their pajamas. There was another little hooded character that had some kind of tablet or something and he was reading from that, but you could not hear him speak. Um, so I watched and so the character that had brought me said, would you like to join them sometime? Um, they're having a lot of fun. And, and I said, yes, I think so. And then he said, well, we'll see about next time. We turned around and the next thing I know, I was standing in the hallway. He walked me to my bed and he left. He walked right through the wallpaper again and he was gone. So uh, as a... As a regression hypnotherapist, uh, myself and you are, and many of us are, the obvious question is, have you recovered the in-between that you're missing that you were just talking about this stuff? The, what happened to you before he brought you back to your bed? Um, I didn't have anything physical done to me at that point. All I was told to do was to observe. Um, that I was someplace different and to just watch the other children. And that's basically all it was. Nothing happened to me physically until I turned to my teenage years and my early 20s. So, okay, so you're, what you're saying is in that first event, there was no actual missing time. He took you no. and took you and brought you back. Yes. Uh, now, I suppose if my grandfather had come upstairs to check on me at that point, I wasn't there. <laughs> um, and he was the type that probably wouldn't say anything, but might have called out for me and then gone to look for me. If he had come back, I was put back in the bed. So um, I, I don't know. So in your entire lifetime, how many... Uh, times have you been taken? Relatively speaking, ballpark. Relatively 50. Wow. We could go for a long time, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so, I know for a fact. How long would it take you to... Uh, okay, so um, I, well, I got interviewed a couple times uh, by Joe Montalvo. And one of the things he mentioned in the interview, he's an abductee, obviously, and uh, he said something to the effect that even though um, most abductees have been taken, you know, this huge number of times, the amount of actual e memory that they have of those events is relatively small. So... My question to you is, if we go, if we went and you went over every single detail you remembered of every single one of those 50 events, how long would it take you to spit out that information, relatively speaking? How much, Ooh. how much time, actual live time do you remember of those 50 events? Live Total. time, hours. Relatively speaking. Oh, I think it would take days. Days, really? Days. Yeah, I don't know how many, um, but yeah, because I've had hypnosis um, by Dr. Romack, worked with him for five years, um, and then here, um, Kathleen Martin is my hypnotist. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you here, because uh, right. <laughs> I can go for days if you can uh -oh. go for days. <laughs> so uh, go to your next event after the one you just spoke of the very next one and go through it well i was taken several times by that little figure um and i didn't know his name 
I was trying to make one up like I made up for all my dolls and toys and so forth. Um, I couldn't, nothing fit. And then my sister was home and they put her crib next to my bed. Uh, hers was against the wall. And after a while, the entities came and they took her. And my dad thought she was just a Houdini escapee, um, that she learned to climb early. And so uh, I told them that I saw her floating. I said, no, she's flying. And I was still just a little kid. I said, she's flying. And they, they kind of laughed like, okay, you, you know, you have a good imagination. Um, although my dad had seen a craft coming toward the house one night, he'd gone to bed with my mom and they were talking. And my dad was a bomber, World War II. So he knew airplanes, he knew uh, flying, all of that. And he saw these enormous lights attached to something coming across the backyard. And he said to my mom, if those things come any closer, they're going to hit the house. So instead of getting up, and getting my grandparents and, and us, my sister and I up, he didn't. Next thing he knew, it was morning. So I said, see, Daddy, they took my sister. They took her. And he said, well, we found her in the living room. She had to have climbed out of that crib and bounced off on yours. You didn't know it. So here he comes with big pieces of plywood. And he builds up the ends of the crib so she can't get out and fixes it so my mom can lift those and bring her out through the bottom. She still floated over the very top. And at one point, she hung on to a blanket. And when she floated out and went into the hallway, she must have thrown the blanket down the stairs as she went through the wallpaper. My sister was terrified of all of this would never discuss it. That's the most I know about her and what happened to her. Um, she never wanted to speak about it when she got older. It sounds like she has never gone public. No, no. Um, she doesn't, didn't mind. She has passed away. She was younger than me, of course, but she, she's passed away. Um, and no, she would never discuss it at all and i think she was terrified of the whole whole thing um so she never, so so when, you said this one character took you uh, a number of times a what did he look like b uh, what did he do with you these times he took you so go with describe him first and then describe what y'all did uh, in general, most of those times? Well, the first time he was dressed in that little monk's robe and it had a hood on. And then I recalled when he walked up to my bed, he was even with my eyes when I got up on my elbow and I looked under the hood and I could see great big black eyes, great huge almond shaped eyes. And um, they were very shiny and he focused very hard on me. Um, and I think that was so he could get me to get out of bed um, and to go with him because I wasn't afraid to walk with him at that point. Um, so we saw the other children. And then as I grew older, he began to come without the hood. So that point he had big bulbous head curved around to a pointy chin, the same great big eyes. Um, he had four fingers on each hand, very thin, very thin, and a grayish, sometimes he was grayish blue, sometimes a grayish tan. Um, he was a little taller after a while, and I don't know why that is. Um, he ended up being about five, six, and I wondered why, but at one point he took me aboard a craft, and there were smaller versions of him lined up against the wall, uh, front to back, front to back, staring straight ahead and never moved unless directed to. So I figure those were robots. 
He was not, absolutely was not. Um, he told me at one point he was going to have to take me in for a little test. So we went in, he put me on a cold metal table and there was an entity there that looked like a praying mantis. I now call him the doctor or scientist. He was so brilliant, um, but he didn't have any emotions, none. Um, he just did what he had to do. One was insert something into my navel. One was to, at one point, put a little tiny pearl-like bead into my eye uh, or the side of my eye. Um, I've had something in my ear. That fell out one night when I was at home. Um, I got real angry with him the first time because he was hurting me. And I screamed at him and I was going to sit up and lunge at him. And he tipped his head and looked at me like, what are you doing? What, what is this? And then I called in my escort, the taller gray, put his hand on my forehead, immediately took away all the pain and fear. And uh, proceeded ahead. <laughs> the, the one who put his hand on your head, uh, he looked different than... He, he wasn't the mantid. He wasn't the guy who took you. He was a third character. No, it's the same one. He had grown. Oh, okay. Got, right. Yeah, he had gotten taller. Um, so as I grew older, um, I had missing pregnancies. Um, I didn't know what was going on if I just couldn't have any more children, which was turned out to be the case after a while. Um, but I felt like I had given birth. Um, I had a miscarriage, and this, I don't, you can put this in or not, but we were in Colorado, and I was having cramping, intense pain, and I thought, oh, what is going on? We had planned a picnic, and I thought, well, if I go and I get some high altitude, I might feel better, so I'm going to go. So we got in the car and drove up in the mountains. It was late fall, so there weren't very many people where we went, um, got there. And my husband and family member went up the hill with our picnic and was going to get a picnic table because we'd been there before. And I said, I'm going to go in the ladies' room. And when I was in there, I lost what I was carrying I stood up and I looked and there was like a debris mound and this thing was lying on the top. And what did he look like? He looked like my gray. He had great big almond eyes. Of course, it was a fetus. Um, and he was all a part of, I don't know what he was made up of, was all there, but he was dead. And I don't know if they took some of my memory away right then because I just closed the door and walked up the hill and I was terrified. And my husband and my brother-in-law were standing. They didn't hear me. I couldn't get their attention. They were staring straight ahead. And out from behind a tree came the gray that always came for me and said, we have to go for just a little while. And he took me inside this craft. And when he did, we just walked through it. And on the way out, he said, I need to show you something. We're going to have to fix what just happened. And there were vessels with all different stages of growth of fetuses. And when we got to the end, which was near the door, he said, look, I looked, and I, I call it the quickening, because this entity shuddered and opened its eyes and looked right at me. And I thought, oh my goodness, is this, what is this? Is it mine? Is it, what's going on? And then he took me outside, and the craft took off. And he, oh, before we left, he said something to me I can't get from anybody else. I just don't know if anyone was told this, but I was told. And he said, one thing I need you to know 
if something goes wrong and you give birth and this child is not what we need, you get to keep it and raise it. And that has never left my mind. It doesn't go away. I wonder how many of them might be here. Who are they? What do they look like? So, um, thinking back on what he just took, what you just stated that he told you, um, I, I must assume you've extrapolated beyond that piece of information in your mind in, in about 10 different directions, yes. trying to figure out what he really meant by that and not just what he meant, but what that means for us as far as you know, if that was done with anybody else, that sort of thing. What, how, based on your research and what he stated, and what you've what you've um, surmised, what uh, have you come across? Do you understand anything more about uh, what you've just said? You know, the larger picture. Have you have you gotten enough information from other people? who've gone through similar experiences that uh, either corroborates, you know, that, that were told this. You've never come across anybody who's been told the same thing, right? No, I haven't. I've talked to people. I've told them uh, what happened. And what they do is then come forward with some thoughts and ideas that I add to my list of 10 million other thoughts and ideas. Um, but some of them match. Well, what if this? What if that? Uh, what if they're all one or two or three uh, types of babies or individuals that are born with, and they name some things um, that I had already thought of? Well, okay, so let me give you one experience I've had because it kind of adds to your story a little bit. Um, sort of in a vague sort of way okay i was going to a mufon event um here in the atlanta area and it was th the best mufon event i've ever been to and it, the reason why i was the best is because nobody showed up oh my literally nobody showed up except me and one other woman and she was like you she was an abductee and so uh instead of sitting in a bunch of, in the crowd listening to uh, a prearranged speech by people who may have seen something in the sky or whatever they've got to say i got to sit and ask question after question after question to somebody like you that has been there and done that and i didn't get bothered by other people who got in the way. So it was a, a pleasure. And so uh, the, the reason why I bring this up is because uh, one of the questions I asked her was uh, basically the, the question that people asked David Jacobs, and that is they're going to come in and re take us over, replace us, right? And she goes, uh, actually, yes, that's correct. That's what they told me. But it's not, that's not exactly correct. It is and it's not. And she explained it a little in better detail about to understand it. What she said was, yes, they're going to populate the earth. But uh, what they told her was uh, pretty much most, most people who are alive now will not be alive when that happens. Their children will not be alive when that happens. Their children's children will not be alive when that happens. And they're, you know, this is like five or six generations down the road in the distant future. And uh, everything I've come across so far states that, um, that, it, that at that time, at that far into the future, the population on earth is like infinitesimally smaller than it is today. So if they do populate the Earth at that time, they're not really replacing us, they're repopulating an unpopulated planet. So it's not a dire circumstance. It's more like 
uh, the Earth doesn't have much on it at that time anyway. So if they come and populate, it's not like it's a huge deal because we're no longer around. Most of us, mm -hmm. most of us have left, either by um, bad circumstance or just chose to leave the planet. Either way, they're not replacing us. They're just repopulating a depopulated planet. And so it's not, um, in a sense, it's true, but it's not really true because nobody's getting replaced here because it doesn't happen anytime soon. So I don't know if any of that's true. It's just something uh, an abductee told me. Now, uh, is there anything you have come across in your research, uh, all of that research that kind of corroborates or refutes what I just stated, either way? No, I would have to agree with you. I don't have an exact time frame like that. However, I was told that they're preparing or we should prepare for a shift. And that shift is going to come and the world will be less populated. Um, it will have changed a great degree. Um, and they kind of showed me a couple of things. I don't know, um, you know, questioning it, whether or not it's true or how to understand it. Um, I went to Kathy for hypnosis to see if I could become or get clarity on this particular uh, thing. Um, and it was that I was taken, was on a craft, and there were all different kinds of entities. There were the grays, the large and small, there were the insect type. Uh, there were just others that I didn't recognize, but they were kind of off in the distance and they were all very disturbed. They felt like what they were doing, and it was some sort of project, was a big mistake that they should not be following through at the present time. And I was in a group of people that was going to take a line to the, to the right to go outside. And I thought, I'm going to outside this craft. We were up in the air. I had been taken from my home here in Florida. It is quite possible that I saw Kathy on that craft, and she thinks so too. But I saw her running, grabbing the hand of a woman and running away and going, ducking into a room down the hall on the left. So we all got in line and we were handed black boxes, small ones, and they had no seams. They were smooth. Um, you couldn't, I, I looked at it. The minute I took it, I felt like I was possessing something that didn't belong to me. Uh, it felt wrong. I felt all kinds of emotions. And I carried it, as everybody else did, down the hall, through a door, and there was a balcony. And they moved the balcony away from this kind of half-moon-shaped craft which I did not believe anything like that could be the case. I was afraid I was going to fall off. And I thought, what, what about the gravity? What's, what's going to keep us here? And they said, step forward and see. So I did. And something was there so I would not fall off. There were about six other people. We were all in little segments that came, you know, little walls that came just above our waists. And I looked and I recognized a man that lived in my neighborhood. And I looked at him and he looked at me like no recognition. So the whole ship tipped and I'm noticing green, uh, evergreen trees, granite cliffs, um, little A-shaped homes. And so it definitely wasn't Florida. Um, could have been Colorado or Switzerland or who knows. And we were told to drop the boxes. They gave us a signal. They had instructed us on the craft. We dropped them and I watched mine going in towards that home and it sparkled and disappeared. And then the whole balcony closed in back where it was. And I said, I need to know what I just did. And so, uh, an entity came forward and said, well, the boxes contained the soul 
of a hybrid that will just find a new family as of tonight. So you've delivered that soul to a new home. And we're not necessarily happy with what we're doing, but we went this far. We now have no choice. So um, I felt just, mm, I don't know. I still feel those emotions when I think about it. And I really don't know what was in the box. I felt something. I felt something that I shouldn't have had. Okay, well, um, interesting. Uh, you don't, it sounds like you're um, taking uh, the soul of a being that, you know, many people talk about, you know, they were on a particular planet in a particular alien race and past various past lives. They weren't necessarily human. So um, a soul, any soul, can uh, be in any kind of body. I mean, it can be the soul of a dog or uh, the soul of a cat or the soul of, you know, I, I took a lady into the future, the very first lady I ever progressed into a future life. She was a fish. And I asked her, um, as one thing she mentioned was that the, the, the consciousness of the fish was an extremely positive state of mind. And after I brought her out of trance, I asked her, was that state of mind as the fish could you, was it so positive that you could live in that state of mind for eternity, forever? And she did not hesitate even one second. She said, yes. So we think of a fish wow. as being, she, we think of a fish as being less than we are. But a soul is a, an aspect of the creator. It's not, um, it's not less because it's in the body of a fish or more because it's in the body of a human or more because it's in the body of a gray, it's God's spark. It's a it's a um, a uh, drop in the ocean of the Creator. It's part of that whole divine being. And I had uh, let me give you one more piece. I had a um, I had a dream one night, and there was this light, and the light was covering my whole vision. It was like almost like a triangle, but it wasn't well defined. It was just a vague, uh, very big light, not too bright, not too dim, that had an edge, but barely. And it had a um, a shadow on the bottom of the light. And the shadow went from left to right, back and forth, left to right, left to right, left to right. And it kept going back. The shadow kept going back and forth. And I thought about, this was a, lucid dream and i woke in the dream i was within the dream i saw the the light i saw the shadow and i'm like what is it i'm looking at and then a second later i realized that was the soul or spirit of a of the dog i had when i was a child it was a, a chihuahua but the spirit that i was looking at in my dream was a massive um being that was an aspect of God that was great. It wasn't a little dog. And uh, and I've had, there was a lady I interviewed, she uh, was on a craft, a spacecraft, and her pet was helping her on the craft, but he wasn't in the shape of a cat or a dog. It was, it looked like an alien type being, but it was, it, she knew it was her cat or her dog mm -hmm. it was the same spirit in a in a in the aspect of a alien on a craft and that dog or cat or whatever that was she had as this uh more advanced concept being knew exactly what she needed to do on that craft she knew it it knew more than she did and so my point here is that um you know the notion that we're 
lower than the aliens or higher than the amoeba or the the cat or the dog or you know there, there's no real hierarchy it's all god and so uh my well i guess what i'm trying to say is that um i don't think you did anything wrong by le- allowing the soul of a hybrid to seek out a human family to be born into i don't think that's even though there may have been some something wrong with it i can't i you know if that if that soul grows up you know i've heard uh, negative things about hybrids i've also heard positive things about hybrids so mm-hmm. that soul has all the choice in the world as a human born as a human to be positive or negative to to use its powers of greater mind that the grays have to do bad things or good things so you can't really you can't really judge what it's going to do in its life based on anything so i i don't think you should have any guilt about what you did and i'm uh-huh. not sure why i i would have a real good question for the beings who had some remorse about thinking that it was wrong i would mm-hmm. wonder why they thought it was wrong but that would be my question yeah absolutely i i do too so i had regret and i could sense their they were running back and forth and, and kind of arguing but it was just more or less uh, strong voices uh coming and hitting me um that i could hear and they were trying to figure out how to stop the whole thing and they couldn't well okay so i i must uh, assume that um they knew something about the future in reference to the soul that is being uh, born into going to be born into a human because um i i must i guess at this point i would think that the soul would help the grays to to advance their agenda on earth that's the only possible downside i could think of that that uh you know i i don't know that the gray's agenda on earth is such a bad thing it all depends on no. how they play it out yeah i don't think it's a bad thing at all i didn't feel that was a bad thing in the respect that they had to do what they were doing it was their project if you want to call it a project but they were again uh regarding the soul themselves having some feeling of remorse about it um that's what it seemed like to me and when i got home i thought but did this really happen except my husband was not in bed he came in and he said were you taken uh and here my cheeks are all rosy and cold and my feet are cold my nightgown was wet from ice cold i guess and here i'm back in florida and he said i had that feeling and he meant in the past he has felt like he was under some sort of anesthesia and he would come to and then come through or wherever i was and say oh you were taken so he knew and comfortable with it because he didn't have to go looking for me anywhere so go through and go through uh the next experience that you'd like to um in part mm. well i'll mention very briefly there were times uh, i was born in hartford connecticut when um nobody locked their doors their windows their cars everything was wide open and i would be taken and i would find myself on the way back in the park next to my grammar school in the middle of the night so i would just simply run the couple blocks home go in the house up the stairs and get into bed no one knew the difference that happened a lot um before i was my early teens and my dad wanted to get into aerospace so he'd been going to school at night and we all moved to california where he went to work for aerojet and um he had a lot of things he had to keep secret keep to himself uh, i never did know what he did 
Um, he, he took some things to some tunnels in Nevada. I know that. He would stay two weeks and then bring them back. And then he would say, and I would see what I would see. And that's all. He, he could keep a secret like no one else. Um, so he was always doing something that required heavy clearances. Um, and then I had entities that were very tall and skinny. Saw them when I was a child. And again in California, I was chased down the street. Um, do you re know the situation with that call in Nevada with the supposed crash of something and then the entity in the uh, family's backyard? Yes, I heard the story. I lost okay. Um, there was something that just struck me to do with that, whether it's real or not, but the policeman said something. I ran from this figure chasing me down the hill. I was, my girlfriend's home was two homes from ours. I ran right inside. I knew that I'd be welcomed. And we told her dad, I said, someone's chasing me. And he said, go and sit down, all of you. On, he had a sofa and like to be, you know, in charge. He called the police. We were sitting on the sofa and watched the policeman's flashlight. We had big, long backyards and lots of almond trees. He was weaving among the trees when this entity came and planted himself on the sliding glass door and looked in at us and then walked off again toward the policeman's lights. And when he did, the next thing we knew, that policeman was standing in the living room saying, don't ask me to come back here. I don't have a partner with me right now. I am leaving. See ya. <laughs> Got his car and went screeching around the corner. And that's what the policeman said to that boy that called and reported the entity in their backyard. He's, if I remember correctly, what he said was that his partner saw the craft in the sky. Right. Um, yeah. Also. Yes. And um, so uh, overall, the, the times that you've been taken, 50 times ish, were you primarily used as a breeder or were there other reasons? I think there were a mixture, a combination, uh, if you will, um, because in one of them, I was taken on a tour of the craft. Um, and I think their main purpose was for me to see the operation of this craft, um, how it was uh, run, operated, handled. And I was taken down a hallway and Kathleen put me under hypnosis. We ended up uh, videotaping it because the first time she brought me out, she was afraid for what she was seeing. And um, I was taken into a room that as soon as I stepped inside, I, it felt like I was in a heart beating. Everything was beating. I could hear it, feel it, sense it. And I looked down and I was on a narrow pathway and the floor, it went every which way, but the floor was fluid. It was a red, kind of bluish, it changed colors, it mixed, it went under the pathways. And I was so engrossed in looking at that and the feeling I had. I looked up and the person that escorted me, he was just letting me do what I was doing, experience it. I looked up and at the far end of the room was something that was biological, organic, mechanical. It was operating the ship and I would call it a she because involved in all of the growth and all of the tubing and everything that was going on was a female. And my first thought was, no, how can this happen? This can't, no, this is unfair. This person is so entwined in that mess back there that I would want to die. I thought that. I felt for this person, and then I heard a female voice saying, 
You think I can't leave when I want to? You think I'm stuck here? No, that's wrong. I can leave any time I want to. I don't have to stay. I can take a break. I can take, and she laughed and said, a vacation like you people on earth. Um, and she said, so I get a break. This is what I chose to do. There are many of us. We all can communicate. We all know where each other are located. And we also know where our main ship is, should we have to go there all at once. And that's what she told me. And what, uh, what, what did you, what thoughts did you have beyond, okay, she, you felt sorry for her. She told yep. you she wasn't in bad straits like you were thinking. Yeah. And did your thinking go beyond that uh, moment? Did you extrapolate? Did you, did you go, what did you think after all? What were your extra thoughts that came after that, if any? Just a, a million senses of, you know, can she really get out? How can she do that? She can't walk out of there. She's a part of this whole. How does that happen? And then I would think maybe it's okay. She thinks it's okay. I mean, as a human, all that's bouncing around. When I went in the first time um, and I was under hypnosis, Kathy said she stopped it because I looked like I was being hit by like beanbags against my muscles and they were all reacting. Um, and I'm wondering if that was the feeling of the heartbeat. So she brought me out and then I said to her, oh, it was a day or so later because I was staying with her. And um, I said, I want to go back. Oh, I want you to record this. So she did. And um, we followed through with it. And the same thing happened. Um, I, I felt so sorry for the woman. And, and here's all this biological, this, this stuff that looked like it was growing out of the back area and down into the pool of whatever liquid it was and then huge tubes um, that looked like they were a mechanical of some kind and all I could hear and feel was that beating heart that boom 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 and I, I asked my escort to take me out that I had seen everything I could handle and he did and looking back on that event, have you come to any, did you ever get to the point where you thought maybe that what she told you was closer to the truth or do you still feel sorry for this female? Closer to the truth. I feel like she could possibly, mm, I don't know if it's out of body. I don't know if that's what it is, but I feel like she did sign up for it, just the same as I feel I signed up for all these experiences. So, okay, so you you were used as a breeder for the for the grades, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you were also shown other things like, like you just told me. So I guess the next thing I would have you do is go to another experience that uh, that you know if you can talk for days, just keep going through the next. Just keep going to the next one. Well, I'll give you the next um, one that I feel is important. Um, okay, that's fine. And that would be uh, 1982, August. And uh, my husband and I lived in Denver, Colorado, but we also had a, a big, well, kind of a mobile home type thing um, in a park on a ranch. There were about 100 of us at the time. Um, and it was backed by BLM land, so it was like 1,800 acres we could roam. And we were traveled through an area called South Park. So never ever did we arrive at dark. We always arrived so we could have dinner with my parents, family, friends, and um, light a nice fire for the evening. So we were at the top of a pass, and we could look down on this valley. 
it's it was um kind of a it was a big glacier valley there was nothing there there's still maybe only one ranch there there was a little town called jefferson at the base of this pass across the other side of it was the collegiate peaks uh, named after what, harvard and and all of those and we were headed that direction. We had to get across. We had a fairly new car, so my husband had set the odometer. I was watching a pair of lights off in the distance as we came down off the side. We usually stopped, got out, walked around, got back in and headed on for a three hour trip. And we were breaking it up a little bit. And I followed those lights until they came over the top of our car. They had to go over, they had big, oh, they're like boards built on the side of the road to prevent those big tumbleweeds from coming across and hitting a car. The same thing in the winter when it was snowing, the trucks could get through and uh, we wouldn't have great big buildup of snow. Those borders stopped it. So this thing came over that. I rolled the window down and looked out and I saw that the lights were attached to something. It was very dark. And I saw, yeah, the sun is still shining. Why do I not see anything but black? And right then I tried to talk to my husband and his hands were on the steering wheel. He was staring straight ahead and he was not responding to me. So I just kind of waited and the car lifted up off the road, went over the snow barriers and off into the high desert. And then it, it came down slowly and those lights came over the front of the car and landed. And it was a pretty big craft. And the best way to describe it is like two dinner plates turned upside down. So the wide parts were top and bottom. There were many lights around the center and it could rotate like that. That's the only way I can describe it. And it came down and the entity came to get me. We went into the craft and the same things were done. I had a little implant put in. Um, I was shown how the craft operated, um, just, just a variety of things, but we were gone for hours. We were missing like two and a half hours. My parents and friends were waiting for us on the other side. They knew we were never late and there was only one road in where it connected with their road. They came from Colorado Springs and then followed into the town of Buena Vista. And seven miles outside that was the ranch. We came to, the headlights were on, the motor was still running. The odometer had not registered any mileage and it was dark out. And so we were both staring at each other like what happened. My daughter was sleeping in the back seat, knew nothing about what had happened. And I, we both, we were terrified and nervous and how could we be taken like that? The whole car lifted up. Um, what are they capable of? So it was more of a nervous, frightening episode. Um, we said, we better get going, drove on to the ranch. As we reached the property where the caretaker was, of course, in 82, no cell phones. My parents were walking down the road to ask to use the phone so they could call and then get, my dad was going to get in the car and drive the route to see where we might be. Um, when we drove up, they saw the headlights coming down the dirt road. And my dad said, what happened? Is everybody okay? And we said, we're okay. We don't know what happened. And he was already working for, uh, had worked for Aerojet. He was now working for Command Sciences and was still being sent out to the desert with whatever he was doing. And he said, okay, okay, that's all right. Let's go in and get dinner. And my mom was the opposite. She had to know and she said, no, you have to know where you were. You have to know what went on. We said, no, we don't. So we went in, had our dinner. Um, we talked about it between the two of us quietly. And um, the issue was never resolved, except 
when I had hypnosis and discovered we had been taken. So how many implants have you been uh, given? Do you know? Um, okay, maybe, maybe three. Um, we, I had one that was in my elbow and Kathy and I traced it. We were going to wait till it got up near my hand and then asked to have it taken out. When it reached my hand, we could feel it. It reacted to a magnet. It was all, it had all of the things we needed to have that taken out. And when we began to plan it, I woke up one morning and it was gone, just gone. Um, one fell out um, my ear. I woke up and I was just itching. I thought my ear is so itchy. I reached up and I felt this. It was like a crystal, but very tiny. Um, I even bit it, you know, like you do a pearl to see if it's a real pearl. So I bit it. Yeah, it was like a rock. I brought it out and I put it underneath our microscope. And it was faceted like a gemstone, but it was clear. Um, I knew it didn't belong in my ear took it back to bed and I thought, okay, I'm going to put it in the top of my drinking cup because the lid was deep. So I put it in there. I looked to see if it was there in the morning, gone. <laughs> so you've, you've had three. Do you have any now? Um, no, I don't think so. No. Okay. So, um, You've told us the the events that you felt were important. Are there any other important events you'd like to impart? <laughs> well, um, the one that my husband remembers physically, um, we were scuba divers when we were younger. We were instructors um, scuba diving, but we were also cave divers. Um, we went into the caves here in Florida and dove the Florida aquifer for thousands of feet, carried all of our tanks and oxygen and all that with us. So we were on the way from a little town. Kathy went up and saw the motel. She's a good investigator. And then followed the route that we told her we took. And the barn that we saw these odd things my husband saw them slightly different from I did, but they didn't belong there. There were some things sitting behind this farmer's barn. We were headed for um, a sinkhole that in the middle of nowhere, you are just told, take a right at the farmer's barn, a left at the white fence, a right at this sign. So that's how we were getting to our dive site. We stopped at a stop sign and I felt funny. Both of us had decided that we feel this odd pressure in our heads when something's going to happen. And I felt that we were taken. He felt like he was foggy. Um, and that's the one time he was able to draw the entity, bringing me back to our truck and putting me in the passenger seat. So your husband remembers that, that part? Yeah. So is most of the time you're taken alone or most of the time with you and your husband? No, alone. Um, he thinks and I think also that we're, he was only taken a couple of times just because I was there and he was, they didn't know what to do with him. Um, Kathy did some hypnosis work on him and he would only go so far as to say he was on something cold and he felt very odd. So we're thinking it was the, the table like I was put on. And when it came to the approach of an entity toward him, he said, no, I'm done. Get me out. <laughs> so that's what happened. So you've had uh, your bio said something about near death experiences. Have you had one or more of those? I have had one near-death experience, um, and that particular illness, I had. I was given 20% chance to live. Um, I'm researching some of this uh, with other people, 
a nurse and a doctor and that because um, I have a blood clotting disorder that no one can say where it came from. So I found out by getting very ill and ending up in a hospital. And this nurse who wasn't a nurse came up to my bed. And again, Kathleen's got my medical records that say I lost from every orifice in my body a violent purple liquid and they did not know what it was. They only saw a small spot of it on my gown because the nurse came and took all my sheets and disappeared. Um, we don't know why. The doctor said, where are your sheets? I said, the nurse took them. She went that way. They couldn't find her. Uh, but she had great big almond eyes. She was wearing a nurse's uniform that didn't suit the year 1969. And she's leaned over and said to me, everything's going to be all right. Well, I had surgery. I had two double strokes. I had surgery, and they removed all but three feet of my small intestine, and we actually have like 22, um, and part of my stomach, some of my muscle structure was all gangrenous. So the doctor saved me or did that nurse. Um, because I felt like she did. And then on the way into surgery, that surgery, I decided I'd had enough of the pain of everything. I'd felt rotten and I had a five month old baby. I said, no, no let, me, let me out, let me get away. And the minute I thought it, I realized I, how to connect the subconscious with your conscious mind and make a decision. The minute I thought that, I popped out and I was up along the ceiling. And I saw the tunnel and I entered. And then all of a sudden I saw what I thought was blackness. Now I do not. Um, and I, I said, where, where am I? I started to look for my hands and my feet. And I said, no, I don't find me, where is me? And this voice said, you're a part of us all, but you can come out if you want, separate yourself out, just think it. So I did, and all I saw was an outline of hands and feet, but I, I didn't recognize it as me. I just felt that it was me. And they said, now see, there you are. And then I realized I could see 360 degrees without turning around. I could see everything that was there and often the distance was a a brilliant glow it was mostly purple and i said uh, i want to go there because it looked like more light to me and some voice that was there said oh no no you can't go there not now i didn't ask why and they said it's it's time to go back and i said no, I don't want to. I saw my relatives over here and I want to go there that had passed on. And I saw this and I want to go there. And they said, no, not this time. And I felt two hands on my shoulder blades and a man's voice saying, time to go. And they pushed and I resisted. <laughs> I was wrestling the walls, the everything that I bounced off. I was fighting it tumbled down the hallway to the double doors and I saw my body lying on a bed with my mouth open and I entered through the mouth still fighting and I all of a sudden started to fight awake in the body and the nurse saying you're gonna pull all the tubes out you have to stop and just wake up and so then I did uh Okay, so uh, you didn't want to come back. You're, you're not untypical. Uh, a lot of people get over there and it's so nice they do not want to come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you've had tons of abduction experiences. You've had one NDE and you've spent a lifetime learning about other people's uh, experiences. So I I hope you can give the audience some enlightenment about 
um, not necessarily MDEs, but uh, definitely the alien side of it. If there's any pattern or understanding that you've come to that you'd like to spend time imparting, that would be probably something interesting that the people would like to hear. Well, I was not treated badly by the entity that came to get me. He could, I'll repeat, uh, repeat that he could kill pain. He could take away fear. He was very gentle and calm. When he had to speak to me, he did so telepathically. I grew to like him. I grew to feel like he was a part of who I am. And now I've only seen him once in the last six years. Um, I miss him. And when I saw him, I would have to say for the first time that he has aged. He has turned older looking and even more um, knowledgeable uh, of what we are all about and what they are all about. And so I would not be afraid. Um, I think that you can say, I don't want to be taken and you won't be. You absolutely will not be unless you sign that contract that I did. Uh, in exploring past lives, I had an experience in my last life. There were crafts that chased us through the mountains. And so I know you signed up for it. How many times? I don't know. I am comforted in the knowledge that I have always been brought back and you will be too. So that's what I have to say. Um, well, you've gone over all your important experiences. Oh, did you ever come to any belief about what the purple stuff that came out of you was? Did you ever? No, 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 no. And they really don't know why I survived. Um, they gave my husband, they said 20% chance of survival. She cannot absorb nutrition. There was so much. And after having the double stroke, I had no speech at all. And you can hear me now. Um, I was just kind of mumbling. I couldn't write. I could, now I have a whole opposite uh, field of, what would you call? Not talents. Um, I, I never would speak in front of anybody for any reason. Um, now, I need to tell people what happened. I need for them to know so that they're not afraid and wondering. Yeah. So when you were on the other side, your NDE, and they told you you were a part of them, uh, do you know, yeah. did, you come into, did you ever come to an understanding what them was? Souls. Lots and lots of souls. So oh. it's, it's like the oversoul sort of thing? I would say so, yeah. I, I think that I was going to go to a place where I would join my own like soul group, but I, they were going to send me back, so I couldn't at that point. Um, I did have a, a life review, um, and I had taken back who I was in the past life because I liked me better. Um, so when I was ill, and I realized, okay, you have a chance. You have a chance to change who you were or who you are now to who you were back then. And uh, if you want to do it, you do it now. So I did. So you, um, when you say you reverted yourself to a part of yourself that you liked better, is there a way of saying that that is different than what you how you've already described it that would clear it up? You know what is that like? Um, like in one lifetime we have one personality, in the next line, lifetime we develop a different personality, and you like that personality? Is that just a different personality that you had? So basically, completely. I don't even write the same as I did when I was uh, before I was ill. People didn't recognize me, and they said to my husband, "Who? where's Denise? Who is she? Who is Denise? And uh, they had come to visit me as I was recovering, and they didn't recognize the person they were talking to. Um, 
I did, and I liked it. I was a strong women's advocate. I wanted women to be able to be a part of society that was equal to the men um, and to be recognized for it. And that's what I did. I didn't want to be recognized for what everybody else thought I should. Um, and that was, I'm a survivor of the Titanic. I am. And I know who I was. Um, it's odd. There are a lot of resemblances. My middle name now was my first name then. So you didn't die that night on April 15th? No, no. Mm -mm. No. You, you survived? Survived. Yeah. And I went on to do, what did I pass away of? A double stroke due to brain tumors in a room in New York City alone. Well, the Titanic hit that iceberg on my birthday, April 14th. It and, did. Yeah, and it, it sank the next day, April 15th. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, or was it the 12th? I don't remember. It either, it either hit it on the 13th and it sank on the 14th, or hit it on yeah. the 14th and sank on the 15th. Either way, it either hit the iceberg on my birthday or it sank on my birthday, one of those. Wow. Uh, and Lincoln was assassinated on my birthday too, April 14th. Wow. And uh, in Ford Theater, six blocks yes. from where I worked yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, you've gone over your, your near-death experience, you've gone over your, uh, the important abduction experiences. Uh, and you mentioned past lives. Is there anything about your past lives that, other than you liked one better, is there anything about them that is notable that you think uh, you, the audience might like to hear about? Well, that that one for sure. I mean, I started out in a coal mine that my, it was a gold and silver mine, not a coal mine, gold and silver mine that my father owned and uh, married and then became very wealthy. Um, and the night of the sinking, I was, I went the opposite of what everybody else thought I should do. So I was sitting in the men's, the men's room, smoking a cigar with the guy I was playing cards with um, when the uh, ship began to sink. Um, but I was chased, we were all chased in that little gold and silver mine town by UFOs. And we were bringing lunch to the miners and they would come up through the pass, three of them, and come for us. I was not taken that I know of at that point. But instead of going into our homes that were right next to us, we all ran up the mine tailings into the mines and hid there so they couldn't get us. Um, have you ever gone to a future life? No, I haven't. Have you ever been taken between lives? Um, I have been guided a little bit, but not taken. Um, I spent one lifetime that I think they helped me to decide on a planet that was all liquid. Say again? I was, I was convinced and went along with it and was taken or put into a lifetime on a planet that was all liquid. Well, can you tell us more details? <laughs> That's not much detail. No, I had, um, I guess somewhere between a, a, a lizard, a type that would swim in the ocean and mermaid type because I could speak. There were places where you could come to the surface and lean. And I have since had some people tell me that there was an area of that planet that they knew about. I don't know if it's true or not, where there were little entities that took care of everything. But I, I loved the water so much. I loved it then, love it now. I could go below the surface when I was scuba diving. As soon as my head went under that, I forgot all about what was up, up above. Um, but yeah, I was kind of scaly or scratchy, somewhere between a porpoise and something with scales. Um, 
had kind of a flat face. I had, which I don't know if it was like little spiky things down my back. Um, and I had what might have been hands, but I, I somewhere between fins and hands that I used. And how did you acquire your past lives through through hypnosis regression, or did you acquire them in another method? Past life, last one. I happened to walk into a home where a woman came in wearing a dress that I knew was mine. The hat, the dress, and I walked up to her and I said, where did you find that dress? And she said, oh, upstairs in the attic. I knew right then, I knew that house had been mine. I knew she was a relative. And she kept looking at me like, you know, you're asking questions that you shouldn't know. She was very elderly. Um, I had her sign an autograph, a piece of paper for me, because um, I felt like she was related to me. And then I, I remembered so much of what happened and of my life. So you just picked it up because you were in the house that you once lived in in the other life. That's where it started. I walked into a house. Yeah. That so was. how did you pick up the one about the uh, the planet with the water? How did you pick that one up? That was a combination of dreams and going for hypnosis in Colorado to try and find out what that was all about. Because I didn't think anything like that could happen. How could you have a lifetime where you were underwater the majority of the time? So that was dreams and hypnosis. So, Another one I so remember. So you picked it up. You picked up part of that lifetime in dreams, and the and then you just got the rest of it through hypnosis. Yeah. Okay, go on. What what you were saying? I didn't mean. Oh, that. another one that I remember um, was going on a trip first time to California with my parents and visiting a mission in San Diego. And my mom had to pay for another tour to come and get me because I left the tour group and sat down underneath uh, a grape arbor and stayed there because I was remembering who I was. I had been a monk and I had been there, I'm almost positive, and went on this monk's walk where we all had to be silent. Um, either learning or praying. I just, I thought, well, here I am. I was only 13. I had no idea what was happening to me until I saw my mom standing next to me saying, what are you doing? You know, I had to pay for another tour to come and get you. This is crazy. And I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. You, you never told her? Uh, I think before she passed away, I did. I think that's one of the things I told her. Yeah. And where was this place you were the monk? It was in San Diego, California. Okay. And how many other lives are you aware of that you haven't told us about yet? Only one. Go ahead. Tell Only us one. one. I was um, in Greece. I was a male. I had been accused of something I didn't do. I don't know what it was. And I was chained to a floor in a great big room and I died there. So it was very quick. I was very young. You were a male or female? Male. And why? you don't know why you were chained to the floor? I was accused of something I didn't do and they wouldn't listen to me. Ah, so you're falsely accused. Uh-huh. Interesting. Yep. So, so is there, um, I, I, I have to suspect with all of your years of research into abductions and all the regressions you've done of other people, there must be uh, at least one or two cases you could talk about that, you know, obviously you're not going to name the people, but the, some details of something that was might be enlightening or entertaining to the to the somebody listening. I'll I'll tell one. Okay. Um, there's a couple who showed up at one of my meetings. I didn't recognize them. I'd never seen them before, and everybody else was kind of a regular um, at my meetings at, at that point. 
And afterwards they came up to me and said they had been sent to find me. They wouldn't go into a lot of detail at the time, but it, their relationship continued on for, gosh, it's been several years now. And it's a little bit of a mystery to me uh, because I felt very close to them, like I had known them for a very long time. Well, they were able to describe what was happening to me in the back of my home in Connecticut. I don't have a picture of it. Nobody does, and nobody did. Just the front. They can describe and did the back of that home, and that they saw me standing in my bedroom by the window with my ET, and that he was touching my forehead, and then said, and you had dark bangs, and you had braids, and you, I had it all, and they were describing it to a T. Everything in the room, they just knew, um, and I asked them, what, what's going on here? I still don't know where they're from, um, but the last time I saw them, I was sitting talking to them, as was Kathleen, and they, the woman was wearing a bracelet, and it was two-tone, yellow and blue, and I, every time she would touch it and it spun around, I spotted a little uh, dark colored bead, tiny, tiny little bead, and I said, where did you get the bracelet? And she said, oh, it looked like she was trying to figure out what to say, and she said, I'm having them made. Um, we're having them made for people to recognize a cause. Now, I don't know what the cause was. And I, so we talked a little more and I, I said to her, I'd like to have one. Can I buy one from you? And she said, oh, we don't have any right now. So as they got up to leave and he came over and gave me a hug, then she gave me a hug, grabbed my hand and slipped the bracelet off her wrist onto mine. So I'm still wearing it right there and I can't take it off. I don't know why. I do not know why. Every once in a while I spin it around. I see the little bead. Those people knew me and, and for a very long time from the time I was about seven years old. Don't know who they are for sure. Um, I would like to know. I don't know if they'll ever tell. They could describe the water planet I was on. Um, they know about that. So that's an unusual story. That's one that every once in a while flashes before my mind and I wanted answers. Okay, so that's unusual t to the extreme. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow, that, I don't even know what to ask you about that. That's pretty... <laughs> When you, when you say you can't take it off, what do you mean you can't take it off? Every time I've tried, like, oh, let's take it off and wear another, you know, bracelet or just let's not wear any, I can't do it. It's got to stay where it is right now. So you have a compunction to keep it on you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and have you ever thought about asking, during all these regressions you've had, with Kathleen and or other people. Have you ever considered asking one of them to um, regress you to a time when you were with those people, mysterious people, and see if you could come up with an awareness during that experience of who they are? Have you ever thought about doing that? I have, uh, and I'm, I'm stopped. I don't, I don't know if there's some sort of timing in all of this, if there's something that's up and coming that I should expect. I feel like I do. And so it's, it's like I'm being told, just wait a little while longer. So. Okay, so. All right, it seems like you've imparted everything you want to impart. Is there anything I haven't asked you that's, <laughs> interesting about your life or lives um, or research that you feel a compunction to speak about you know something you're doing gonna do uh, have done or want uh, you, this is your chance to speak anything that you want to say before 
uh, before departing from the audience. Okay. Well, I have a nurse who's going to help me. She's working on her doctorate with nurses. She's super intelligent. I've got a couple of other people in the medical field. I want to research number one. I'm beginning to ask questions on immune deficiencies uh, because there are so many people who have been taken who appear to have some form of that. Um, and then I have just decided to look into movement disorders. How many people who have been taken have uh, Parkinson's-like or Parkinson's uh, disease? Um, there are others. ALS. My dad passed away from that. I know someone else who has it. Um, there's something called myoclonus. Um, so I want to see how that might relate. How, how do these crafts affect people and are we left with these illnesses um, as a result of visiting them? So are you, I must assume you're familiar with, um, the, I don't know if it's Harvard or MIT, the, the fellow that, um, God, I'm trying to think of his name. He's fairly recently famous. He's Either for, he either works at Harvard or MIT. Oh, he, he's, I... he deals with brains. He's he's been asked yeah. to research, uh, or one of the things he's done was research people whose brains have been messed up because of ET contact. You do you know who I'm referring to? I can't. I do, and I can't come up with his name, but yes. Yeah, but you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you? Have you reached out to him in, re in reference to uh, how uh, contact with aliens hurts people? I have not, but I should now. I need to remember his name. <laughs> um, absolutely. Well, send me an email. I'll look him up. I, it's easy. Um, one of us will come across him in the near future, and uh, you can either send his e information to me or I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll figure it out and okay. let you know. Um, All right. So, uh, because I know I've seen him around recently, so it should okay. be easy to figure it out. I just do a little Googling. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I uh, want to hear all 50 of your experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to sit down and Okay, grab a microphone and go through all 50. <laughs> all 50. Oh, my goodness sakes. Well, it's been a true pleasure, a real pleasure. It feels like a fireside chat, you know, and that makes it so. easy. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, any last thing you want to say to the audience before I stop the recording? Um, no. If you've had experiences, I, I would like you to read the book. Um Alien Abduction Files by myself and Kathleen Martin. If you've had an experience and want someone to talk to, you can reach me at dmstoner, the number one, at gmail.com. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And uh, let me go ahead. And you're always welcome to come back if you have anything else you'd like to impart. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, here we go. We're going to stop now.